I think that there's been there's been this sort of myth out there of if VW, if GM, if Ford, if Tesla go out and announce that we're going to have 10 million, 20 million, 30 million electric vehicles in the next five to 10 years, the supply chain will just show up by itself because there's so much demand out there. And that is fundamentally just not true. In this episode, we're going to break down an ARK Invest podcast with the guest Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Specifically, they brought on Vivas Kumar and Simon Moores. These guys are literally at the forefront and on the cutting edge of the pricing and logistics of the lithium ion supply chain globally. I honestly learned a lot from this episode and I'm confident that you will as well. But the most important thing they said from the whole podcast was to like this video, take one second, go down there, like it. It really, really helps the channel. With that out of the way, let's get into the information. Cobalt is the highest profile. It doesn't seem to be going away, even though comparatively compared to lithium and nickel and graphite anode in the battery, there's hardly any cobalt used. Uh, it is a very important element because it's, it adds a, a stabilizing factor to the chemistry and therefore it's important and we believe uh, at Benchmark that cobalt will always be needed in a lithium ion battery for the foreseeable future, it's just in lower quantities. I thought this point about cobalt being important for cohesion and stickiness was key and also it was important to note that they really don't think cobalt will be going away completely anytime soon as they believe it's important for the chemistries moving forward. Lithium is the other big one that we get a lot of questions on and lithium is mined in South America from brine operations and it's extracted as a hard rock in traditional mining operations in Australia but then that gets shipped to China and converted into chemicals. Now if you're not familiar with brine ponds and brine harvesting it's basically harvesting minerals that are dissolved in water through evaporation. So think about these big ponds that are laid out and take up a ton of space they sit there for months and sometimes even years and they let the sun evaporate the water, which will then leave you with the minerals that are then used. Which is going after this whole idea of eliminating brine ponds forever. And just to understand why this is important, not only is that tremendously inefficient, it also has an environmental footprint that is just staggering. Now they're going to touch on supply and demand now and then what it'll look like in the future. If you look at battery cell capacity, what Benchmark is tracking is that approximately two thirds of global battery cell capacity today is in China. And even 10 years from now in 2029, even though we're gonna be growing to over two terawatt hours of battery capacity, two thirds of that will still be geographically within China. So, I mean, the impetus for this has just been that the electric vehicle market is growing exponentially fast and China has done an extremely effective job. Companies involved in China have done an extremely effective job of centralizing the supply chain so that more of that value capture can happen within their borders. Yeah, so right now we're at about 450 gigawatt hours of global capacity of global lithium ion battery capacity. Now, rewind back five years to 2015, we're at 60 gigawatt hours of capacity. So the point we try and make is that the, the battery industry has grown five times of between four and five times in, in the last five years in terms of capacity and the supply as well. In this part here, the number they're referring to is the expected supply and demand in 2029. 2.4 2 terawatt hours. 70% of that's in China, 9% of that is in the USA, and 17% of that is in Europe. Our demand forecast is actually 1,900 gigawatt hours. So the, the build out of battery plants is actually going a bit faster than say with the demand expectations, which is good news for electric vehicles. It means the battery, the volume of batteries will be there. Then of course, will the raw materials be there because it's easier to build a battery plant than it is to build a nickel, cobalt, lithium mine. At 1.9, 1,900 gigawatt hours of demand by 2030, of which we expect about 90% of this to come from electric vehicles, bear in mind. So it's all been driven by EVs. These supply and demand figures are really driven by EVs alone without factoring in too much from any energy storage developments. Now they're going to talk about lithium and how they believe that is actually the most difficult mineral to sustain, not nickel, not cobalt, because of how dispersed the supply chain is. And lithium is an interesting one because lithium is 300,000 tons of chemical last year. It's going to have to go to 1.8 million tons. Now for lithium to get to, to get to that. There's no geological constraint. There's no shortage of these minerals in the ground. It's actually building the supply chain and getting them out the ground in the right quantities and the right quality. 
but lithium, I think, is still the, the biggest challenge of these raw materials to get to that kind of scale. And the absence of investment in lithium chemicals is for us the most concerning element of what's happening in the battery supply chain right now, right? In my previous life, I was a buyer at Tesla of all of these materials. And all I cared about was how can I get the best quality materials for the lowest price possible? We had to find ways not only to go out and buy the material, but also convince companies to invest in, in you know, scales that they've never invested before for these types of specialty chemicals in the battery industry. The other problem is that independent investors themselves are reluctant to move into investing deep in the supply chain. And this was really eye-opening because when you think about it, who's going to do that investment for the new mines and the new cathode and anode plants? It's not Tesla, at least yet. And so for these companies to make investments like that, that take 5, 10, 15 years to develop the mines and to develop the plants, it takes time and there's huge risk involved. And what they're getting at is without this investment, this revolution is really not going to happen at the pace that it should. It was strange because a couple of years ago, China started investing in cobalt chemical capacity way beyond what it needed. That was government money, obviously, but it, the point was they were very forward looking, knowing that this electric vehicle thing was definitely going to happen within China at a minimum, mainly because of the air quality problems they've got and because they had the technology themselves. And so what China's done is it's ensured that all the trade flow arrows go into China before they make a product and then they go over to the US or to Europe. What the US needs to do is replicate that. So not have the trade flow arrows go to Asia and then to the US, but make sure they're going to the US first. The USA has, and that means building battery plants, it means building cathode plants, it means building anode plants. The US has seven battery mega factories in the pipeline at the moment under construction or in the planning phase. China has 97. So you're going to need a lot more. At the moment, the, the US is wholly reliant on the Tesla Gigafactory going from 37 gigawatt hours like it is today to 58 gigawatt hours, then uh, jumping again to over 100 gigawatt hours. You need battery plants the size of the Gigafactory. It also needs cathode capacity to feed into, that, into those mega factories. It needs the specialty chemicals plants that can do lithium hydroxide, lithium carbonate, nickel sulfate, cobalt sulfate, cobalt hydroxide to be here in the US. So this is really important for the long term that America finds a way to change these trade flows. Of course, we can't just mine more resources that aren't located here geographically to start, but it's the steps after that that we do have control over. It's the refining of those mined materials and then eventually the cathode and the anode plants that happen even before the final stage of battery cell production, which is what we refer to as gigafactories thus far. And so when it comes to costs and control and avoiding geopolitical concerns, that stuff is all going to be factored into how America can build out this capacity and get people to invest big time money in the pre-gigafactory stages of the supply chain. So one of the last clips from the podcast that I decided to pull will actually be contradicting what Sandy Monroe recently said on that Now You Know interview. When he was talking about how once solid state batteries hit the market, how all lithium ion batteries will completely be irrelevant. I thought that statement was a little reckless in nature and this is kind of proving that to be true. So take a listen. My favorite misconception is that don't bother investing in lithium ion batteries because a new technology will beat it, will come out and replace it. One thing I say about that is lithium ion batteries, they're getting cheaper. So the average cost of a lithium ion battery cell at the moment, automotive grade lithium ion battery cells, $125 per kilowatt hour, our midpoint average. Now you can get that lower than hundred at the moment from one producer, but that's a good number, 125. So that was 280 three years ago. So that shows you kind of how much batteries have dropped. So number one, lithium ion batteries are getting cheaper. So even when the next generation battery tech hits the market, lithium ion most likely will not be going away. Think of all of the supply chains and the factories and the logistics that will already be in place. And the plan is to have that demand continually be there for the next 20 years. So as things scale, yes, this new technology can be in addition to it and it can drive the forefront of the numbers. 
but lithium ion is not just gonna stop and become irrelevant and everyone's gonna quit using it because they are driving the cost down, they are improving performance seemingly monthly. And so this is a huge takeaway that just because solid state batteries are looming and when they hit the market, it's not gonna deem all lithium ion batteries irrelevant. So I hope that you guys learned something from this episode. If you're not really familiar with ARC, you need to familiarize yourself. They're the leaders in disruptive technology. And honestly, in my opinion, they're the only analysts out there that are even close to being able to value Tesla at a reasonable valuation because they understand the disruption and the long-term and all of the irons that Tesla has in the proverbial fire. So if you're still here, please like this video if you did. Consider subscribing if you'd like to learn more about Tesla and the EV space, as well as investing and finance. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you in the next episode.